And this is Marek Drives live in English tonight. For those of you who felt neglected yesterday, I hope Kevin N. from Canada is watching tonight. Now, my guest tonight is the star of what he says in his channel description, is the number one car review channel in Ireland. And according to Social Blade, because I checked it out, his channel is actually twice as big in Ireland as mine is in Poland. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, the one and only Bob Flavin. Hello. Well, good evening. How That was a fine introduction you've given me there, Mark, I have to say. <laughs> Well, the the biggest car reviewer in uh, in Ireland. Uh, by the way, YouTube is is a how should I put it is a broad uh, broad medium. Uh, what are the uh, most popular genres genres on uh, on YouTube in Ireland? Uh, gaming is probably number one, but then behind that, of course, is makeup, which I don't do, you know, and then <laughs> vlogs and bedrooms and things, which I do kind of do. This yeah, is, you you, you are of... you are in a bedroom, yeah, and also you you said you do your own hair, so I do uh... my own hair. Do you like it? It's good, isn't it? It just stands yeah, up. It's... And it's all shaved on the sides. That's how it works here. Pretty good. I used to kind of do my own hair, but then my girlfriend said that I should not do it anymore, and. Um... <laughs> And this is how I look now. Um, <laughs> just give up entirely. That's that's a great excuse, though. <laughs> I'm just going to have a beer instead of cut my hair. Thanks. <laughs> uh, by the way, for everyone uh, watching, don't forget to follow Bob on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter. Links are in the description below this stream and later below the video, which it's going to become. So Bob and I met online. Not like that, obviously. Um, uh, no, I was fully dressed at the time. <laughs> exactly uh, I think it was like the YouTube YouTube algorithm plus your Toyota GT86 review which uh, I remember in, in the review you were quite excited about it now uh, it's been what 8-9 years since that GT86 video did mm. you find any vehicle this exciting since then there's been exciting I, I it depends on feeling I suppose it's very hard to find things that are exciting that you can drive slowly it's a good noise you're having fun but you're not breaking any speed limits and i think that's where the gt86 come into like golf R or golf gti is far more exciting to drive and very involving to drive but but the problem is that you, you turn in and you feel really safe in that lovely volkswagen way you know that kind of thing that disconnects you slightly so you feel i can go a little bit harder so when a gti lets go it really lets go instantly but the the gt86 still has that kind of it's like a car that shouldn't be going fast. It does, it's not supposed to, but yet it does. It's still fun to drive, though. So the Golf GT, uh, the Golf GTI, then that's mm. your yeah GTI okay. or even Golf. If you got a bit of extra money, a Golf R. It's four wheel drive, though. It really does savage the bank. But Golf R can, is probably the most exciting. I can never um, get the hang of the um, the all wheel drive in the Golf R. Uh, no. My girlfriend loves it, and uh, you know, I was thinking about buying a Golf GTI at some stage, and she said, "No, no, no, we got to go for the R." Like, wh why? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you don't need it. Okay, but uh, <clears throat> since we're since we're on the Golf, and uh, you know, exciting or less exciting cars, actually, uh, today I picked up the Mark Eight Golf, and I know you've been at the launch event in December. And mm. okay, during these launch events, there is little time to drive, and you have to film and everything, but. Today, I literally drove it for like 90 minutes, so probably my experience with the car is comparable to yours. Now, yeah. we can compare our first impressions, maybe. Now, to me, it's like the same shell, but with a lot more tech. It's like the Mark 7 3 and a 3 quarters, I would say. Yeah, from the side, it looks like the Golf 7. It just, just, it. You'd mistake, you'd nearly mistake one for the other from the side of the car, the side profile of it, even going around the back. The front is totally different. But yeah, tech-wise, they, they seem to have taken their cues from the ID3 and, you know, that kind of plastic interior, that ultra-modern, high-quality interior, and just put it into the Golf. But it does feel a little bit like an afterthought, though. Some of it does. It just feels like a little bit like Volkswagen just want to make some money out of it, and that's it. I mean, I've seen the, what is it called, the ID3, which will one day finally have its software updated and be mm -hmm. released to the clients. And... The dash does look similar, and the new uh, new lights panel kind of thing, and the whole infotainment. So they like okay. 
I was hoping that mm. by making the electric ID3, you know, doing a clean slate kind of thing, they would have it reserved for the electric, let's say, sub brand, mm -hmm. whereas they would leave the Golf um, a bit different. But it seems like it's a unification all across the board now. Yeah, I think I think that's what they're at. I think what Volkswagen are trying to do now is to make it easier for their customers to decide what car they're going to buy, but also much easier for which one Volkswagen want to, to make because a lot of the parts are transportable from one car to the other, so you can just take it out of one and put it into the other wheels, the steering wheels, and that sort of mm -hmm. stuff. And I think they're after that, kind of with the dashboard and particularly with the electronics. I have a Passat for the last few weeks, and I find that the infotainment system is very buggy. When you start mm -hmm. up the car first, it takes a long time, even it for a radio does. to start so, on. So it wasn't only me, was it? No. Because I had the Passat uh, old truck uh, around New Year's, and uh, it did take ages for the thing to boot. Mm, even just for a radio station. I mean, I, often things take a while to boot when you're going into some sort of wireless car play or something, but mm -hmm. it just seems to, like I turned on the radio today and I couldn't get off the welcome screen. I just wouldn't go away. So I ended up, I actually drove all the way to the shop and then the radio came on. It's a good wow. 10 minutes wait. So, and I have another journalist friend of mine who said that when he was, um, when he was down home on a damp, cold morning, it just didn't boot up at all. The screen wouldn't come on and it happened every day. Wow, so they've beat Jaguar to uh, to bed infotainment system because in, in Jaguar, <laughs> JLR basically, JLR cars, it's uh, it's nice what they did first, I think, in the Velar, and then they have like different iterations of it in their other cars. And so it's, it's all right, but there would always be something wrong with it. Either it would crash on me in the Velar, which I assumed could have had to do with the fact that I was starting and turning the car on and off again all the time, for filming mm. so i said okay fine you know it could have it could have uh, crashed on me because of that yeah in another one there would be like a kind of line going through the middle of the screen without you know without pixels or something uh, in another one the one of the cameras in the 360 view wouldn't work etc etc but uh, yeah volkswagen used to have some of the coolest and probably most reliable infotainment systems the easiest to use and i think they're out of uh, um, out of their depth here with uh, with what they have i think um, i think that happens with most of the most of the car companies have that problem i had the same yeah. thing with jaguar land rover as well infotainment system breaking down I had the Land Rover Discovery a couple of years ago, not the not the newest one, the one before that, and the suspension broke on it, and it ended up going into limp mode to drive home at thirty kilometers an hour. So, it's it, there's so much tech behind it that's not been made by car companies. I really do fear where it's going with that, where that's going to end up at some point. Uh, it's um, yeah. <clears throat> I will be talking, or we will be talking about autonomous cars in a moment, and mm. this is probably uh, one of the fears that I have, probably you have, and many other people have, that, you know, you're going to get into a car that's been designed by, um, uh, well, software programmers, and something goes <laughs> wrong. If, your com if our computers crash right now as we talk, you know, we'll just reconnect, and that's it. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah... Uh, this this could be a problem. By the way, uh, Simon Thompson says that uh, Toyota have the worst infotainment systems. Um, they are improving. They're reliable. They are improving, and ever since they got uh, Android Auto and Apple CarPlay, pff, I don't care what it's like anymore. You know, I just I just use the Google Maps and uh, and I'm fine. I have the CHR right now. If Toyota delivered a car down to yeah. me, so and that has the Apple CarPlay on it, and uh, it's very light, very dark interior in the CHR. I find it very claustrophobic inside, but the car looks it gorgeous is. on the outside. Yeah, it's it's wonderful, but uh, it should have this uh, cross traffic alert when reversing as standard, yep. not only on the top uh, on the top trim, yep. but otherwise a great car. Which engine did you get, by the way? It's the I think one point eight hybrid, not a two liter hybrid. It's a two liter version, of this, okay, isn't it? Okay, so you got the underpowered one. Yeah, the underpowered uh, one, and it comes on all the time. You know, the hybrid cuts in yeah. all the time, so it's very annoying in that respect. The two liter, it goes as it's supposed to, but it still could do a bit more. It's, mm. I mean, the, the suspension in it is uh, is very well, um, very well sorted. Now we've been planning this. Uh, conversation here we're having uh, for a while and i even sent you some topics and yep. then yesterday 
uh, late in the evening, I sort of emailed Bob and said, you know, well, the, the picture you sent me for the thumbnail doesn't really do it for me. Send me something else. And you sent me one in uh, the Grand California. Now, yes, <laughs> I've seen several of your camper videos and I thought, you know, let's let's talk camper vans as well. Um, you seem to enjoy the camper van experience now, but is it something you like because you're a car journalist who just gets to drive cool cars around the summer vacation? Or would you actually be prepared to kind of, you know, make it your lifestyle and, you know, buy one, something like that? If I was, I, I'd love to make it a lifestyle. I'd love to actually do camper vanning the whole time on a, on a permanent holiday. My kids love it. The wife loves it. We really get into it as well. You know, we bring the little little uh, stoves and the tents and the bits with us to do the whole camper van stuff. But generally speaking, the camper vans we get on the press fleet have all been Volkswagen. Uh, we've had a couple of Renault ones as well, but none of them really are the Swiss Army knife. You know, some you can make them work some ways, and other ways they don't work as they're too small or they're too big or they're they're too awkward to park. There's always something wrong with the with the ones that come on the press fleet. But I definitely would do camper van holidays the whole time if I could. I'd love to actually live on the European continent to be able to travel much further by road. Unfortunately, I'm on an island. I don't get very far. Uh, but the problem is, at least as far as I understand around Europe, it's there's not really anywhere you can kind of, you know, park and camp except for camping sites, which mm. kind of defeats the purpose because then you're surrounded by people who are... <laughs> Smelly. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, okay, you do get your sort of showers, toilets, etc., which makes a smaller camper van like the, the, the regular California or the, what was it, Mercedes-Benz Marco Polo, or I think you, you reviewed a Renault of some sort. It makes it more usable because then you can just uh, live out of this, drive to the next one, etc., etc. Mm. But uh, for me, it's the problem with the people that I can't be alone somewhere nice because there is always, true. it's, uh, when we go to some of our, some of these car events and we're like, I don't know, someplace in Sardinia or something, which would be lovely. I mean, I'd love to kind of drive to the beach and, you know, do my, uh, shoot my review there and go further on. <laughs> and wherever you go, it just says private, 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 private. You can't go anywhere. Yeah. So I'm afraid with a camper van like this, you wouldn't be able to go very, um, very far. Uh, I think that's a problem for everything. It's not even Europe. It's it's everybody's getting a little bit tighter on it. We we had the the Grand California, which I'm not a big fan of. It's it's awkward shape and it's hard to drive. It's not economical or anything. But but we stopped because one of the kids wanted to go to the toilet, and there's a toilet in it. So we just pulled up on the side of the road, and the child went to the toilet in the toilet in the camper van. Mm -hmm. But as soon as we pulled up on the side of the road, an old man came out from his house straight across the road and asked us if we're okay. And that kind of, you know, you're not actually going to park there and camp there. Now, you know, he was, he was straight away pointing. And then his friend appeared after a few minutes, just checking on him, sure it was okay. So it's like, there's no way you could stop this thing. Everyone's going to come over near you. So we had to go to a campsite. It is it is conspicuous, the, the Grand California. Mm. Now, my problem with, okay, uh, these are kind of ready-made cars uh, out of the factory and you don't really have much choice. I think in your car, you could either spec the top bunk or you could live without it. I think this yep. was like one of the few options that it had. Uh, now, what I had last year was a crafter-based camper. Um, so it was like the Grand California in terms of size. However, it was... Um, it was like a taste of what it's like before the before the big thing before the Grand California comes out. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was designed in such a way as to make it, as to be able to, for example, transport bicycles without having to remove wheels, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, which again, probably yeah. a great idea if you're uh, yeah. on vacation. But it also made the rest of the interior, huge interior, uh, pretty much uh, unusable. Um, because there was just everything was focused on the on on the garage. Is it is it is it called the same in English when you're talking about camper vans? Because in Poland, when you talk about the storage space opened from the from the back in a camper van, it's called a garage in Polish camper van. Yeah, slang. similar here. We'd call it a garage or or a storage area, depending on the size of it. Yeah, garage is what it would normally be called. Okay, so 
since everything was focused on the garage, th there was very little uh, interior space, and uh, the bog was terrible. I mean, I, I had to use it uh, with sort of my legs, one leg sticking out of it, because <laughs> Going you just can't, it's too, it's too tiny. <laughs> It's it. too <laughs> tiny, and uh, you know, you try to take a shower, and you know the the the, the gray gray water tank is full. Your uh, what's the clean water tank called? Um, fresh water tank. Fresh water yeah. tank. Yeah, it's it's empty instantly, and uh, yeah. <laughs> it was. I a... tried filling the tank, and it all fell, fell out in the ground. So I had a hose in the pipe, and I was trying to fill the fresh water tank, but it was just oh. coming out the bottom of the, of the car <laughs> all the time. And then I got that stopped. But as soon as I ran a tap inside the, the van, it all came back out again, just came straight back out to the bottom. It was it's an awful experience. I think a lot of the time, a lot of the guys who do conversions of camper vans, mm -hmm. there's quite a trade in that. You know, they don't actually make yes. camper vans. They just convert vans to being a camper van. My neighbor is doing guys, that at the moment, actually. And yeah. uh, he has that Mercedes... Uh... Well, the bigger one, not the not the V class or the Viano or whatever it was called, the bigger yeah. one, um, the one which used to be a crafter. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, he's got the big one, uh, Sprinter, or even Sprinter. That's what it is. Sprinter, yeah. yeah. This it's a lifted Sprinter with huge off road tires, and he's doing a kind of you know go around the world <laughs> conversion to it, and uh, this is going to be a wonderful, wonderful project. I mean, I'm I want to see it one once it's done. He's even got uh, plates W zero for Warsaw and then R L D as in world something. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, this is gonna be this is gonna be a cool thing. And he wants to go with his wife, kids, and do a kind of Asia trip, whatever. Go to Vladivostok that's like or something. Paradise. That's like the best thing ever. That'd be brilliant. I'd love that. Yeah, only that uh, we have the coronavirus thing right now. But <laughs> I know, but sure, what's a little coronavirus between friends? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, let me just let me just uh, scroll through the comments here because uh, I think there was uh, there was uh, something. Okay, there was a question from uh, Andy FX Seven. I'll put it up on the screen. Um, uh, sales in Ireland are down sixty three percent in March. How does that compare with you, Marek? Well, as a matter of fact, I was about to talk. I was about to talk about it, and I even wanted to ask Bob, what are what's the situation in uh, in Ireland at the moment? In Poland, let me just look at my notes here. We are down about seventy percent um, from twentieth of uh, for the for the first twenty days of April. Mm, we're down seventy percent, more or less. Uh, the small cars are taking the biggest hit, obviously. There is a bit of... Um, okay, the situation is less bad in uh, in delivery vans because obviously there's a lot of business uh, with delivery. So, uh, so, but it's still like 60 something percent. So it's not like it's not like it's down 10, it's 60 percent down. Uh, yeah. Now, uh, there is, uh, let's see, um, Tesla, surprisingly enough, which is not actually officially available in Poland. There is one sort of dealership which imports the cars for you if you can't speak English and you can't use the website. So they will put a 20% markup on it and bring it to, to you to Poland. Um, wow. They are the only one who actually recorded growth, 118% growth. So they sold three <laughs> Teslas instead of whatever, one and a half. <laughs> or something like that. Um, Mazda is down 88%. Whoa. Whoa, yes. Um, you might as well close the, the shop at that point. like. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they're not a big seller in Poland. Well, they're not a big seller, generally speaking. But in Poland, they're not a big seller because they don't really do fleet sales. <clears throat> not right. that much anyway. And Volvo is uh, sort of like the least screwed because they, they lost only 43% of sales. Oh, but they are um, sort of you know your kind of sole proprietor car, so to mm. speak. Well, Ireland's gone essentially because all our dealerships are closed. Really, this month is going to be fairly much a write-off. At some mm -hmm. point or another, we're going to find that there's yeah. very little left out of this month. Um, I don't know whether I don't, I don't know whether we can get to a point of reopening soon. We're supposed to be lifting our our some of our lockdown systems mm -hmm. on the fifth, which is next Tuesday. But like we're here at rumblings Poland. from the government that going, no, we don't want to live mm -hmm. too many lockdowns. So, mm -hmm. but like, who wants a car at this point, right now? Even if the, all the dealerships open tomorrow, 
who's going to go to the dealership to buy a car? There's no money. Like, there's no exactly. jobs. Um, funny, uh, funny statistic I read recently. In Poland right now, it might actually, because, I mean, people are dumping cars. Uh, if, you know, if you have a lease on a car or a whatever financing, you just want to dump it. Uh, it might be actually cheaper in some cases to get financing on a new car than actually take over a financed car from uh, from someone else who wants to dump it. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's a strange... I, we've never had a time like this. We don't know exactly what's going to happen next. Yeah. I do know a lot of the car companies are starting to manufacture again mm -hmm. in, in smaller capacities maybe, but I think that's more about about making deliveries. They're, they're trying to make the deliveries that are all, cars that are already bought. And they're trying to get them delivered. So but that's, I'd say a lot, that's, that, that's that, another that. thing. People don't want to pick them up. And since they don't want to pick them up, there is no invoice. And, uh, you know. Yeah. I wonder how many cancellations cars companies have had on new car sales. You know, people paying deposits and then kind of canceling out because of coronavirus. Uh, let's put it this way. Um, I have a sort of, I have data for a sort of multi multi outlet dealership. This is like whatever seven outlets, mm. and in these seven outlets, uh, private private buyers bought something like twenty cars within a month. Wow, that's hard to do. <laughs> that's not good for nobody. Yep. Uh, changing the subject, uh, Irish Car Channel. Um, See that? Hi, uh, Irish Car Channel. Hello. <laughs> and Eric uh, Rocher, I say hello to Eric Rocher there. He's, I see him in the, in the comments. Okay. Uh, he comments all the time. He's asking Paul about S. After, aftermarket Android radios for older cars. Mm. I've yeah. seen several. And Some are okay, though. I mean, they're okay. I think the problem is kind of like we had with Volkswagens these days, that it, they take a while to boot. Mm. It's like starting your Android phone every whatever time you start the car i mean they yeah. probably have a bit of a delay when they kind of you know shut down completely and i would expect that you can sort of uh, program that delay depending on how good or bad your car battery is but generally speaking you know boot it up and it just takes a while so i found there was a chinese company sends me things i still mm -hmm. don't know who they are they never send anything with it so it just comes in an amazon parcel and it could be a sat nav or it could be a, a radio or some headlights mm -hmm. anyway whoever it is they send me stuff so uh, they sent me a radio an android radio the problem was the connector on the back of the radio had nothing at all to do with modern connectors this thing came out of something from the 80s like you know those old molex blocks or something they call them it was a weird little block uh, it wouldn't fit the car, but I got okay. it working. I got it, I think it hooked mm -hmm. it up to a 12 volt battery essentially, and uh, it came on. But then the whole thing was in Chinese, so I still couldn't figure <laughs> out how to turn it on and get it into English or anything. So it, it was really hard to do. But I think some of the Android stuff does work. The problem is there's a lot of it out there. There's tons and tons and tons of it being made out there. So some of it's very high quality, some of it's very low quality, some of it just does everything. I've seen ones that can play videos and DVDs in cars. I've seen ones with TV receivers and stuff in them. They can be very, very sophisticated. If you're if you're driving a 10-year-old car and it hasn't got a touchscreen or Bluetooth connection, then you probably can't go wrong with an Android connection. Yeah, I mean, if you have a space for a 2 din radio, because uh, they're usually the bigger type. Yeah. Yeah, particularly I have a say it now. Volkswagen ones are, are double height. You can get a full kind of okay. touch slide out screen version of it. Worth, it's worth a punt. If you got an, a Saturday afternoon, you'd fit it yourself. Mm -hmm. really. It doesn't have that on to fit a car. I've seen a wonderful little concept probably 10 or 15 years. <clears throat> wow, that's a long time. I was still doing the uh, tech uh, show on the, on the radio. And uh, there was this concept where you would get uh, an adapter for your smartphone. <laughs> This was, I think, pre-iPhone or maybe just early iPhone, early Android phones. And um, you know how you had those radios with a security panel that you would take off? Yeah. So yeah. your smartphone would be like that security panel. Um, you oh. would use your smartphone, insert it in the radio, and, uh, you know, it would do, it would be the brains of the radio. Obviously, it never worked out because uh, too many types of phones, uh, too many types of adapters. So Yeah. Essentially, but, that, was, that was before Apple CarPlay. Yeah, that was Apple CarPlay before Apple CarPlay, essentially. Yeah, exactly. But it was it was a very nice concept. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm sure if someone put their mind to it, they could probably order a couple of thousands of these in uh, in China and you know try and sell them. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 
There's a question from uh, Jakub Godek, uh, my Polish viewer. Hi, He's asking me whether I would consider making uh, used car videos. Um, and this is something I will ask you too, uh, mm -hmm. Bob. Now, my problem with used cars is that, um, first of all, they are hard to come by, i.e. I would have to take a viewer's car. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm reluctant to do that because of insurance um, situation. I just don't want to have uh, any problems, you know, something breaks, whatever. You know, I would like to be able to cover that if anything breaks. And I know that um, my insurance won't cover it. I tried looking for a policy. I mean, you know, everybody thinks, oh, you know, I'm going to get an insurance policy like Doug DeMuro and I'm going to have, you know, one million <laughs> coverage for whatever. Um, yep. Well, good for him. Uh, apparently, in the States, it's possible. Um, in Poland, it's not. So this is my main concern here. And also, in case of used cars, Polish market, at least, is very specific in the way that uh, there are a lot of clunkers that come to Poland. And, uh, you know, I can tell you anything about this car. You know, okay. This is whatever good. This, you know, it breaks here, but, you know, change this, replace that. And then you're going to get another example, which has been assembled out of three different cars and yep. nothing works there. So I'm not sure how relevant uh, would my used car advice be. Yes, we do this. We have the same problem here with insurance. Although I can get temporary insurance to drive pretty much any car mm -hmm. uh, and it's fully insured. But the worst part for me would be to break something on the car that is not insurance policy you know like you break the stereo or you pull a, a yes. stalk off something mm -hmm. small that's really going to damage the car um but for used car stuff the problem is there's such a variety of used cars you drive one mercedes you have another mercedes right beside it it's com treated completely differently completely different, one is yeah. really bad one is really good uh, and you've got all these other problems with them um, with the condition of the car, people are using that to sell their car as well as the other part now using your review to sell a car mm -hmm. and what they're actually selling, what you actually reviewed, the change. There's always that risk as well that they take the wheels mm -hmm. off or something, you know. So it's a it's an oddball, it's an odd way of coming at it to, to review used cars. I know I can do it through dealerships. So I can go to a dealership here in Ireland mm -hmm. and get Elena one of their used cars and review that. But you always feel a little bit beholding to the dealership to be nice about the car then, you know, so you can't necessarily just kick it to pieces and say it's the worst car ever. So there's a little bit of that too. Uh, what I considered always to be a very nice way of talking about used cars was uh, uh, one, of the, one of the guests on your show uh, recently, Johnny Smith, he used to do, uh, in fifth gear, he used to do the kind of cheap skate alternative yeah, uh, yeah. to whatever cars they were reviewing. And that was really a nice way of presenting a used car an alternative to whatever where you know he would just take a car for a budget of let's say five ten fifteen thousand pounds which would be an alternative to whatever they were reviewing and he would just give you like three points watch out for this that and that and uh, you know that was very nicely presented mm. i'm not sure how relevant it was to a uk or irish buyer but uh yeah, it was it was interesting. I mean, for example, in the I, I recall Audi A two, the the one that was a flop because it was too expensive to maintain. Um, Good I car. I think you though. mentioned something about cracking uh, cracking uh, panoramic roofs there. You know, mm -hmm. something I didn't know. Again, very niche car, but still, now I remember. You know, always look for cracked uh, roofs, uh, glass yeah. roofs in the uh, Audi A two. So maybe that's the way I should do it. Could do. I don't know whether used cars, how long it stays relevant. For for me, is making content online is that I found some of the older videos now have become popular again mm -hmm. as the car has become a used car. Yeah. I, I reviewed it brand new, but now it's used in American people are looking up the review again. So it does come back around. I, some cars, unfortunately, I never really get to test um, the longevity of a car and how long yeah. it's going to last, how reliable it's going to be. And it's usually the first question. Uh, someone, when they want to buy a car, people go, how reliable is an Audi A6? And you go, well, I've never had that and break on my ones. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I mean, they're all the only, brand new. You know, you, you've heard my story. The only car that broke down on, on me was the Renault Espace, but <laughs> and that was brand new. Oh, my God. But apparently they fixed it since then. Oh, of course, yeah. They'll fix, they'll fix these things fairly rapidly when they break down. It's, it's very, in Ireland, I know for sure, 
the vast majority of cars that I get from on the press release are checked the day I'm picking them up. Someone goes through the entire car, they check it, they clear errors, they make sure there's nothing wrong with it. I've never read, the only cars I've had break down was an Alfa Romeo, which completely broke down, had to be towed away by the AA. Um, a Jaguar, no, a Land Rover Discovery broke down once and I had to some other car, I can't remember. I don't remember what the other one was. I think it was a used car actually, but it broke down as well. So I've only really ever had two serious uh, uh, breakdowns and both of them were, were expected being an Alfa Romeo. <laughs> you have to expect this part <laughs> of you to deal with the Alfa Romeo. Uh, the Alfa Romeo never broke down on me. However, I did see my friend, I was, uh, whatever, uh, Picking up or uh, giving away one of the one of the press cars uh, in the Alfa Romeo press fleet office, and I see a friend of mine driving. Uh, it was the Spider, so probably ten years ago or something, mm. and it's uh, it's something like November, and he's with his roof like in the sort of up position like this, <laughs> <laughs> and he's and he's from another city. <laughs> and I asked him, how long have you been driving this? He's like, uh, the last 120 kilometers. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so he was driving very slowly with the roof kind of vertically up like this. And, uh, you know, but, you know, a little uh, little glitch like that. Mm, My a friend question... bought a Fiat 500, you know, the convertible one. The one with yeah. the, it has a sort of a rollback roof. Yeah, it's on got a sliding right thing, yeah. Yeah, but it only rolls back. So it doesn't fold up like a parachute. Mm. It rolls back down the thing. But the the day he bought it, he came to my house and he showed me the roof open. Mm. I was going, oh, yeah, that's very nice. And it, it kind of folds up on top of itself. It's lovely. But then he rolled it up and he was driving away. It started to rain and the roof started to go down on its own. <laughs> and it wouldn't go back up. So the roof just went down to the bottom and stayed down. And he could not make it roll back up. The fuse went or something in it. But it just rained inside his car for the rest of the day. Ouch. Uh, something I've... Uh seen well i haven't experienced it as such but i've seen it because i was looking through the uh, car manual i had uh, must have been an vo well voxel for you opel astra tt i think it was called twin top mm -hmm. oh yeah, uh, yeah back in the day when coupe convertibles were uh, were a thing uh, and in the manual there was a kind of emergency uh, emergency procedure for putting the roof up or down if it broke down. Mm. And it's like three pages of, uh, you know, pull lever A, hold <laughs> screw B, then release uh, whatever, release catch D. And then once you have your hands like this, then just lift the whole thing. Mm. So... <laughs> I never had to do it. Uh, apparently, there must be something like this in my Mazda MX-5 as well, because I have the coupe convertible, uh, the, the, the hardtop convertible thing, but never had to use it. However, what uh, what we did, um, I met this uh, writer, this woman who writes uh, crime stories in Poland, and she's um, she's she's very thorough with with her research, and you know she would ask whatever her friends, uh, acquaintances whatever they, you know, whatever they specialized in. And uh, I was, for one book or two books, the designated uh, car guy. So for her book, we actually made this kind of like a scene with, uh, with the Top Gear and the pink, the pink Micra Coupe convertible. Oh, yeah. But in oh, that okay. one, it broke down. And to make it more market specific, it was a car imported, used, obviously, secondhand from the Netherlands. And the manual with the emergency procedure was in Dutch. So uh, <laughs> we made it, uh, we made it uh, difficult for the, uh, for the protagonists. Now, Irish Foxhound is asking uh, whether we have road motor tax or is it like the French and paid through the fuel purchase? Um, okay, so I would have to ask you, Bob, to explain what's your road motor tax like so I know what we mean by that. So we have two kinds of motor tax in Ireland. One mm -hmm. is a very old style one. It's based on the CC, the cubic capacity of the engine. Mm -hmm. So the more, the bigger the engine, the more mm -hmm. tax you pay. And a more modern one since 2008 is based on CO2 emissions. So the higher the emissions, the higher the road tax you pay. That's the two oh. main ones we have. Okay, so in Poland, you there is a excise duty on the car, which depends on the engine displacement. So okay. below below two liters is cheaper, and above two liters is um, 
more expensive. And it's like a huge difference. It's either 3% excise or 18% excise. So, for example, Mercedes, when they introduced a 2.1 liter diesel a few years ago, uh, they were really crossed, crossed or cross, cross, angry, uh, with the situation that, you know, their clients would have to pay whatever 15 percentage points more on a car which was actually cleaner than whatever a smaller displacement engine so something like that uh, and this is one tax we pay and another one we have uh, which is included in the price of fuel i think like 50 or 60 percent of the price of fuel in poland is uh, some sort of taxes excise vat etc we also have a tax on fuel which has nothing to do with road tax but we we do we do tax about about 70 Eight or seventy nine percent of a price of petrol in Ireland is uh, is actually tax because the government does not okay. do with us, and we pay road tax on the cars, and we pay VRT on buying the cars in the first place, which is an extra tax on top of VAT. Mm -hmm. So we pay a lot of tax on cars. So at the start, the problem for Ireland and the problem that's been there for years is the price of our cars is very distorted in comparison to other countries. Like if I go for a say at Leon here in Ireland, mm -hmm. and I go on a press trip down to Spain where they're made. And I'll see say it lay on there from fifteen thousand euro, sixteen thousand euro. In Ireland it starts at twenty five. Like oh. it's we, we just have all these taxes piled on top of it to make it more expensive. So it really distorts the the, the value of the car when you're gonna buy it. Okay. So for example, the golf I am driving right now is specced out to be about uh, 145,000 Zlotus by four, that's uh, what uh, almost uh, almost 30 30,000 euro right mm. 30 Gee, something yeah. thousand euro 30 something thousand yeah 32,000 okay and that would be a fully specced golf 1.5 uh with you know all the bangs and whistle auto, uh, whistles automatic how much would that cost over in ireland you're talking about 40 a little bit over 40,000 euro Okay, so um, no, that'd be tossed, but that'd be what we call Highline Volkswagen Golf Highline here. Yeah, which definitely is very Highline with options. Yeah. yeah, right up the top, you'd be well over forty thousand mm -hmm. euro. I think it starts. I saw the price list today. I think it starts at about uh, at about thirty or twenty high twenty something thousand euro for the Highline, and then it's got like whatever a couple of grand options on it. Mm. Okay, so it is it is more expensive over at your place. Very uh, much more, Eric. Is it Rockford or Rochford? Eric uh, Rockford. I'll call it a Rockford file. So it's Eric okay. Rockford. Mm, <laughs> Rock how do main car brands buy sales normally compare between Ireland and Poland? Um, well, volume wise. Okay, let's start with volume. How many cars were before the crisis? How many cars did you sell in 2019 in Ireland? 160,000, 170,000, something like that. Okay, so in Poland, it's probably about five times that, and this was a mm. good year. So, um, but yeah, four or five times that. Uh, pff, something like a million or a million five hundred thousand used cars which are brought in, but that's a different story. Now, mm. uh, what sells best in, uh, in Ireland? We have, there's a top three that generally just swap places mm. all the time. You know, they go up and down. Yep. So Toyota, Volkswagen, um, the third place flips about a bit. It was Ford for a very mm -hmm. long time. Ford was one, two, three, but Ford mm -hmm. in the last while now has dropped off a bit. So it, it's generally one of those three, though. You'll find Toyota's usually number one or Volkswagen's number one. Okay, so in Poland, it's uh, usually Skoda, Toyota, Volkswagen, and then whoever else. Uh, Hyundai and Kia were uh, pretty high up the list in recent years. Mm. Um, Ford has been dropping gradually, but it used to be like in the top five for uh, for many years. Opel's been also going down the down the drain, but uh, Opel fell of... off our top ten. Believe it or not, Opel fell outside that. Yeah. That's how far Opel fell. Mm -hmm. Volvo will probably be in the bottom of the top ten. Mm -hmm. Um, we have definitely Kia and Hyundai would do very, very well, Hyundai mm -hmm. particularly. But a lot of those guys do a thing, I don't know if it goes on in, in, in Poland as well, but a lot of those guys do a thing called pre-regging, um, yep. which happens a lot. So just on the 30th of the month or the 31st mm -hmm. of the month, a dealership will register 10 or 15 cars and all dealerships mm -hmm. do it. So all of a sudden the, the sales go through the yeah. roof and then the discounts from the following month. Uh, in Poland, uh, 
the, uh, the, 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 the whatever car monitoring market company, which is called Samar. Uh, yeah. This is our main source of uh, car data. They always say, but they never have it like properly calculated. They say there is something called the re-export. So many of the cars which are registered in Poland, probably by the dealers, are then re-exported uh, from Poland to whatever, Western Europe. Um, I remember when there was uh, cash for clunkers in Europe, especially in Germany, um, mm -hmm. they would come to Poland, buy the cars much cheaper than they were in Germany, and claim the cash for clunkers in uh, in Germany. <laughs> so that that was a catch. <laughs> yeah, I mean, th th it worked out very well. And I mean, I'm surprised that the Germans did it because the Germans are so, you know, uptight and uh, rule abiding. But, they uh, like their rules. Yeah, I mean, you know, when there's a couple of thousand euro to uh, uh, to save, then pff, yeah, you know, everybody everybody wants to save a buck. Nine, uh, nine, it's verboten. <laughs> you shall not <laughs> sell your used cars. <laughs> Uh, Billy No Mates uh, 1974 asks uh, Billy No Mates. Whether, hey, mates Billy. Uh, I feel some car companies won't survive this, like Aston Martin or McLaren. Mm. That's a tough one. I'd fear for Jaguar Land Rover. Mm. They have some serious financial difficulties at the moment, for sure. Mm. But, but I but, wouldn't uh, be worried about uh, luxury brands because there's always someone willing to pay yep. top dollar for. Uh, even more limited and more useless. Well, use. I'm not. No, no, useless. I'm not being fair. Uh, more impractical. Mm. That's also not fair because McLaren is actually a surprisingly practical car. I've Can driven be. a 570s, and uh, I was surprised at how well thought out it was uh, for um, you know for for a sport slash GT car. Mm. It was actually very well thought out. Better and the first Martin, McLaren could easily just make five or six um, McLaren 470 GTS yeah. slash something or other, sell them for a million quid a piece and get some cash flow going. Mm -hmm. Aston Martin might find it a bit difficult to do something like that, but they're they're so heavily connected to things like James Bond and that kind mm -hmm. of realm of things that people will always buy into their brand. But the, the smaller ones that were struggling all along or were being funded uh, from outside, being funded from China, being funded from India, those kind of ones, they, they could struggle into the future because if they weren't making profit up to this point, they're definitely not going to make profit now. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael Kluch, Michal Kluch, he's my, um, he's my regular viewer. Michal, um, Michal. We could call him Michal, that's a very Irish yeah. name. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> this Michal, it's Michael in, in Irish, it's yeah. Michal. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it's actually Michael Key, if you want to translate it fully. Uh, what about Android system operated car like the Polestar 2? Is it a good idea uh, or would you prefer separate infotainment, Android Auto? Let's forget about Apple. Um, I prefer choice. I prefer them separated out. I like mm -hmm. a choice of what I want to do rather than being forced or funneled into the one where a car company is telling you how you're going to do it. Mm -hmm. um, that usually grates on me in some or another. Like if they put some, like, you know, when they move the, the window winders to the middle of the car, mm -hmm. right? It's a simple thing. Just, they just put, they just put the two buttons on the middle of the yeah. dashboard or somewhere else. And it's just, why did you do that? Like every, no one else does this. It's just being controversial for the fun of it. So the same applies for anyone who's just going to force me into Android auto mm -hmm. or force me into something that I can't change for myself. I like Apple CarPlay. I like Android auto as well, in fairness, but, I just prefer um, the, the spread betting of it. Now, I wouldn't be worried about um, being forced to use Android Auto because I'm sure it's going to have uh, Apple CarPlay as well. Uh, mm. What I think is that uh, it's just a system that's heavily based on Android. That's how I would uh, probably describe it. And uh, we've had the systems heavily relying on Microsoft, for example. Fiat had Microsoft-based systems. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, besides gotcha. journalists, besides car journalists making jokes that, uh, you know, you're going to have to find control, I'll delete with the three <laughs> pedals. Uh, <laughs> it's true. You know, otherwise, you know, it, it, it worked pretty well for what it was. I mean, I think that the most you could do is this was one of the early eco nanny systems where you could insert your pen drive and uh, then take the data home for analysis. Oh, wow. <laughs> Yeah, That's they had terrifying. that. They that had that terrifying. in a Fiat, and I don't think anybody's ever tested it. I don't think I'd want to. I don't want to know. I don't want anyone to know what way I drive home. <laughs> I drive within the laws. 
<laughs> okay, let me just uh, see what's happening here. Um, There's Aaron Milan. I see he has joined us. Gavin Byrne. There's a few Irish names popping in there along the way. Welcome, okay, boys. Okay, so uh, I think I think I have to skip forward a bit. Uh, uh, again, uh, what were? Uh, can you read a question to me so that uh, I know what we're looking at? The last thing I see on the screen is from uh, Mihal, who has says, "Yeah, because odometer resets every million. That's the last comment I see on the screen. So okay, right. Uh, so I can't uh, quite see the columns so like an army. Got, we've got a few. Uh, we've got a few other ones here as well. Uh, we have Opel. We do have Opel in Ireland as well. It's only Vauxhall in the UK. Okay, so it's Vauxhall in the UK. All but right. we do. There's so many imports in Ireland. It's the one that stands out. It's the one that everybody notices because um, when you when you import an English used car, if it's an Opel, it's going to be a Vauxhall. It has a different badge in the front. Exactly the same mm -hmm. car, but it's a badge thing. So people notice you're importing UK cars. Mm -hmm. uh, Simon Thompson says Tida needs cash for clunkers. Tida, that's my hatred. I hate Tida. <laughs> Uh, the Tita was terrible, but the Pulsar, yeah. which they made it into, and then they oh, added gotcha. it, the Pulsar was a very good car, actually, and I don't know very why practical. it wasn't selling. Mm. Uh, well, I was surprised, because that was a nice little car, that, that Pulsar. It, it was okay. I mean, it was it's okay for a Nissan, um, but it was very reasonably priced and well-specced, and it was kind of roomy and all. Just nobody seemed to pick up on it. Yeah, I, I think there was too much of the kind of uh, Tita legacy, and people... Um, <laughs> Uh, it smells of Tita. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, Michael says once again that I think Alex on Auto or Savage Geese did an awesome video why you shouldn't ask a reviewer to talk about reliability of a car. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I will have to. I will have to look for this video. But uh, yeah, it's true. Reliability of a car. That's uh, something that unfortunately you will find out. Our viewers. Um, after uh, you know, we tell you if this car is at all worth considering. Plus, there's a per there's a perspective thing in it too. So mm -hmm. when people, there's your perspective when you're reviewing a car, mm -hmm. when I'm reviewing a car, might be two totally different feelings. And then when someone gets into the car, I think it's brilliant. And someone else, a user, goes to buy the car and gets in and goes, I don't know what he was talking about. It was horrible. So this happens. I mean, look at the World Car of the Year as a car none of us has ever driven. There's all kinds of things that happen in, in the car industry that changes how you feel about that mm -hmm. car. And it's usually from a person perspective that um, I, I might like a car, you might not like a car. It's just the way it is. Yeah, I mean, you know, you seem to be uh, tall and thin as far as I remember, and I'm fat and short. So, you know, Don't about putting, thin, us, but yeah. putting us uh, in the same car, we're going to have different uh, impressions. I mean, besides the Volkswagen Golf, which we clearly all love, like all yeah. Volkswagens, uh, obviously, all journalists love Volkswagens. But uh, other of course, than that, don't we all? Everybody's the same. Yeah. <laughs> Every, everybody likes a Volkswagen. We're all getting that check from Volkswagen every time we do a review. It's brilliant. Oh, so you're getting that too in Ireland. Yeah, you get the little <laughs> envelope in the glove box. That's just like this car, I like it. You're obviously bought by Volkswagen. I get that a lot, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, the Little Yellow Ducks. Uh, do you know, guys, that in Poland there are no cars with mileage above 200,000 kilometers on the odometer? Very <laughs> odd. Um, it's uh, It depends uh, how, much, how much you want to pay for it or how much you want to believe. This is actually a fascinating subject, and it's something that they should... Uh, I'm waiting for someone to do a sociological research on it, because you will get a guy who comes into a dealership and he sees a car that's obviously whatever 10 or 15 years old and it's been in germany and it's obviously done hundreds of thousands of motorway miles back and forth yeah. which is not a bad thing a car doing motorway miles is nothing bad it's nothing there's nothing wrong with it no and uh, however since it has whatever 200 300 300 kilometers on the on the odometer uh the prospective customer was like, oh, you know, that's uh, that's a bit too much. And he's like, well, how much would you like it to be? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, oh, you know, 150,000. Like, okay, fine. That'll be whatever, uh, 1,000 euro more expensive. But, you know, we can get you that. And, you know, they'll just, uh, it's called, uh, it's forbidden now, by the way. It's legally forbidden and you can't do it anymore. Uh, but uh, it used to be called um, odometer readjustment or correction or something like that. Something like that. <laughs> Uh, when, you, when you cross the Polish-German border, or rather German-Polish border, because you were going into Poland, um, you know, the first the first several miles along the route, you would get these uh, 
odometer uh, correction facilities, let's say. <laughs> and God. you know they would sort of you know they would wind it down from whatever five hundred thousand to three hundred thousand to make it uh, so that when they roll it back for you another one hundred thousand it wouldn't look that bad. <laughs> <laughs> Just get your drill out, and start drilling it down again. Amazing, yeah. absolutely. We used to there's, a, there's a, still a, a car clocking thing in Ireland that's mm-hmm. problematic, and I know dealerships to some degree electronic odometers can be mm-hmm. reset by dealerships as well. I've seen them do it. You know, I've, I've physically stood there and watched the guy reset a thing yeah. from 160 kilometers down to zero again. Mm-hmm. It's no big deal. It shows up on the OBDS, all right, but mm-hmm. but um, it, clocking is a massive massive problem. I mm-hmm. I tend not to worry about the mileage of a car so much. I worry about the condition, who owned it, yeah. what kind of driver they are, because someone who drives a lot of fleet guys are forced into service uh, at particular times and service in particular main dealerships. Most of the fleet guys go up and down big long mileage, mm-hmm. but they go up and down a motorway where a car is totally untroubled. Two liter diesel or three liter diesel on a motorway and six gear is only taken over. Yeah. It'll be in, in good condition. So uh, it's a condition thing about a car. When you look at it first, you go, is it in good shape? Does it look tired? Does it look like it's gone off? You know, what, what kind of conditions in Mileage would be way down the list. I'd be more worried about a car that shows very low mileage and is in very poor condition. And then you're going, okay, this is probably hiding a lot of errors as well, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, it happens a lot on most of these. these uh, unfortunately, because odometer even exists, because people put a lot of effort into it, um, there is a problem. We have a thing called NCT here. It's National Car Test to make sure your car mm-hmm. is safe. It's a rip-off, generally speaking. Mm-hmm. Um, most cars are fairly safe, but it does record the mileage. Okay, so it's like visit. MOT in the UK? MOT, same thing, yeah. So okay. we would do, we would record the mileage every single time. Mm-hmm. So as you of, can't ask for the last NCT. Last year or the last two years in Poland, we also record the, uh, the mileage. Uh-huh. So gradually, you know, gradually it's uh, it's becoming more, um, it's becoming more tight, I guess, watertight. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, I think the police, if they stop you for whatever bigger offense or something, they can sort of check it or record whatever you had on your on your dom- on your odometer at the moment. So yeah, they are slowly uh, closing that branch of business. Uh, no, I like that the- comment there. Bottom there, Mitza says mileage to be negotiated. <laughs> <laughs> yep, exactly, negotiated. exactly. <laughs> I like it. Yes, the price is non-negotiable. Mileage, we can talk. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the Irish Car Channel again is asking, am I still allowed to collect press cars in Poland during the lockdown? And it's actually an interesting situation because the lockdown in Poland f- wasn't like a 100% lockdown, stay at home or you'll be shot. Mm. Uh, we were allowed to leave the house, whatever, for the grocery, whatever, walk the dog, something like that. I walked a cat. We have a nice. cat on a leash. So uh, the leash. I walked. Yeah, yeah. I because the, 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 the previous cat got run over by a car, so now my my girlfriend said, "No, this one's going out on the leash." So, um, wow, I'm yeah. tr- I'm struggling to figure. Does it walk or just you just yeah, drag it, it walks, behind it you? Walks. I mean, uh, she, right. Frankie the cat. Uh, I'll link to her Instagram profile because she's an Instagram uh, thing. Uh, she walks God. on a leash, right. and uh, and uh, yeah, and she's used to it from from being a small kitten. God, why didn't I think of this? This could have been... That's such a money spinner. I could have had a cat in the review with me the whole time. Yeah, Walk the cat. Sometimes, sometimes she walks into... Uh, sometimes she go, goes into the boot or something. You know, when I when I film, like, whatever, uh, cutaways, last-minute cutaways next to the house, and Anna's walking the cat, you know, the cat will appear in the in some of the shots. So, yeah. You, you should can, definitely... You can, you can follow should. Franka Kotka, which is on the screen right now. You can follow her on Instagram. And then go and follow Bob. <laughs> It's okay. I want to follow the cat. This, this is the cat is on the batter now. Definitely, definitely <laughs> follow follow the cat. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, back to the to the press fleets. Most of them closed, and I remember uh, sort of late March. Um, I really had like five or six cars lined up for the end of March, and I was really wondering how I'm going to, uh, you know, do it. Uh, how I'm going to fit all this into relatively short day because the day was still short whatever and mm. they just got cancelled one after another one after another you know whenever i saw yeah. a um a, my my phone ring i knew it was the press office for whatever mercedes bmw whoever and they just one after another they cancelled which i totally and fully understand and uh, you know i'm not 
I'm not blaming anyone for it. Um, however, a few companies stayed. Mm, they kept going. Uh, Mazda, Mitsubishi, uh, Toyota, I think. They were the three. And Volkswagen Group. Volkswagen, they had some small hiccups. They had to rearrange their kind of uh, press fleet handout procedures. But they would uh, disinfect the cars, etc., uh, etc. Et so, for example, from from a Volkswagen, you get a car with um, the key is in a bag, like a string bag, which uh, looks like you're, um, you know, like you're getting drugs from a dealer. And um, <laughs> I know which one I would prefer. Um, I would not about that, though. And you even get a tiny bottle of hand sanitizer with your Volkswagen, which is also a which nice, a nice touch. Uh, so anyway, um, yeah, I mean, I've seen these cars. They, you know, they, they they put these ozoning things inside machines, so you know the the, the cars are properly aired, disinfected, etc. So anyway, we could w get out to do work, and since this is my work, I was allowed to leave the house and do work, mm. which is what I did. And to be honest, uh, I actually enjoyed the lockdown because there were far less people where I needed to film. Yeah, it's good, isn't it? I like the lockdown thing, though. I'm okay because I've I've always been working at home anyway. Mm -hmm. But but now when you go out, people don't talk to you. People stay away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you you can go wherever you want to go, and nobody goes near you. Nobody asks any questions. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. This does have some advantages, yes. Um, mm -hmm. You know, silver lining, let's say. But I heard you got a lot of uh, cars cancelled as well, and you you had yeah. a dry moment. All of them, apart from the last one, I was booked into Passat on the Monday. I picked up the Passat was the day that everything started to mm -hmm. close down. But they thought they might be able to continue until the following Monday. Mm -hmm. So I was supposed to get a Skoda and a few other mm -hmm. cars were booked in as well. I was doing the same as you, kind of cramming in a few cars mm -hmm. at the end of the month. And um, then it's just all completely dried up. Now, we're on a proper lockdown, so you can only go two kilometers from your house. Um, okay. You're only supposed to go to go to the shop or go to the chemist or, you know, you're not supposed to be visiting anybody or going anywhere like mm -hmm. that. So our lockdown's a bit more enforced. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, Toyota has delivered a car down here. Mm -hmm. I've had a few other car companies ring me up and go, have you got room to take more cars down there? Mm -hmm. Which I kind of do, but I don't have that yeah, much. You seem to live now. like on a, in a in a rural area, I think, yeah? Yeah, just slightly out in the rural bit, but the main road at the front has plenty of parking spaces on it, so you just kind of rack cars up behind each other. Yeah, so but, you uh, can drive two miles back and forth and uh, yeah. you know do your drone shots and everything. Well, if you go around in a circle two kilometers uh -huh. from your house, it's actually 12 kilometers. It's 12 kilometers Brilliant. circle, so you're, it's fine. It's loads of driving time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I wish I lived in a place like this. Mm. It's uh, much easier. My normal filming day is probably about 100 kilometers if I don't want to get too cinematic. If a car is more interesting and I need to do more drive-by drive, drive -by shots, whatever, then it can, you know, be 150 or something. I remember when they gave me the McLaren or whatever, they said 200 kilometers limit. Like, guys, <laughs> uh, 200 kilometers is what I'm going to do today once I get out from your dealership just to drive the car to be able to say anything about it. Another 150 is going to be me filming the car. And then, you know, you can, you know, bring a tow truck if you want and take it from there. But, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't go after the most of that stuff is on sale in Ireland. I mean, you can't buy it. You can buy it. You can buy it from mm -hmm. the UK or from Northern Ireland, but you can't really get a lot of that performance stuff. So I don't. I never really chase it. Although this year I'll be doing. I Porsche wasn't chasing it. They actually called me, which was nice. Yeah, it was very nice. Wouldn't mind visiting McLaren. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, uh, I you know these are the sort of brands you don't say no to, like you know McLaren, Rolls Royce, and I did say no to a Rolls Royce Cullinan. Oh uh, yeah, well I would too. In fairness. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was about the it was about the sort of timing. It was kind of very last minute and uh, very last minute, very small mileage. So, and again, I know the car, the the the, the Rolls Royce cars, they kind of travel from country to country around Europe, and um, as they do, they have like a prearranged number of tests. They want to cram as many tests as possible throughout the week that the car is in Poland. So, uh, you know. Obviously, for them, it's better to do whatever seven reviews day after day than, yeah. you know, give it to me for like three days so that, you know, I can uh, write a proper script and uh, say what I really think. <laughs> <laughs> Bentley called me once upon a time from Northern Ireland. They're mm -hmm. not Bentley official as a dealership. And they said they were going to give me a Bentley, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. I don't know. 
Uh, and I said, okay, I, I, I come up and see. And he said, well, listen, just um, you bring it back and, and, you know, you have to fuel it before you go. And this is where the conversation was ending. It's like, I have mm-hmm. I have to fuel it? Why am I fueling it? <laughs> you want me to test the car. You fuel it. <laughs> so we, we disagreed over the fuel mm-hmm. thing. So I wouldn't. Uh, it's too far away. Northern Ireland is mm-hmm. three hours from here. So three, three and a half hours. It'd be a long drive in any car to do that, you know. Right. Uh, Hellhound. What is it with you guys and hounds there? Uh, hellhound. We had a we had a foxhound and now we have a hellhound. Oh, uh, that's us. We're the hounds. <laughs> you're you're <laughs> in the hounds. hounds. Okay. So anyway, uh, do I have a favorite '80s '90s car? Well, uh, this is actually something I've been uh, considering uh, maybe a year or two ago when I was. Uh, I think it must have been around my 40th birthday when I thought you know it's time to do something about it uh you know buy a car you know that would probably be around my age or something and uh, do something stupid with it uh i didn't do it in the end because uh because of the french um <laughs> okay so it's not like i have a favorite favorite car from the 80s or the 90s or 70s even uh mm. it's rather i was looking for something interesting within a certain budget and okay i soon realized that anything below 10,000 10, euro is going to be crap so yep. that kind of uh, uh that was a bit of a deal breaker for me because first i thought you know i'm going to buy a cheap car for a thousand euro two thousand euro whatever and it's going to be it's a project a car, car and it's going to be cool and <laughs> but what <laughs> am i going to buy a toyota corolla or whatever volkswagen golf or yeah these are boring cars so what i found was a and I started looking for one, was a Citroen GS slash GSA, because they got an A uh, somewhere along the route, uh, probably with a facelift or something. Uh, yeah. They had, not not as a weird dashboard, not a weird dashboard like in the Citroen uh, CX, or was it the mm-hmm. GSA that had the weird, you know, the, it had... It had indi- indicators on like knobs and things. And That's right, yeah. It was properly weird. Uh, one of them had this kind of like a old uh, bathroom scale speedo kind of thing. And it was out of this world, first of all, when it comes to the interior, how it worked. Mm. Secondly, I think it had a boxer engine, which made it also quite interesting. It also had yeah. air suspension, which was bound to break. Yep. And, Comfy, but brick. Uh, yeah, and I think the pre-facelift model had an interesting boot. It wasn't a hatchback as such. It had a tail... Well, it was weird because it had a hatchback shape with a... Or maybe a... Uh, what's it called? Liftback shape. But uh, the yeah. boot opened just like that with an entire with the entire bumper. Yeah, uh, which was very interesting, and I thought you know this car would be very interesting to own and to fix and to buy it in France and drive it from France to uh, Poland. <laughs> How stupid I was! Um, <laughs> but you know what? I, you know what? Uh, you know what? Uh, what killed the project? It was the French and uh, their website called Boncoin. Uh, it's All their right. bon coin it's called uh, and apparently it's their like you know if you want to buy or sell something this is their website they go to however right. however the french being uh, very uh being very french about it uh, first of all, everything in there goes. I, I spoke to a uh, to an Instagrammer from France. We follow each other, and I asked him, you know, what the hell, what's the deal with it? And he said, ah, you know, everything first of all goes to spam. Second of all, uh, if your French is a bit dodgy, and obviously your name isn't French, uh, they think uh, you're trying to scam them. And <laughs> and in my in my best French, as far as I could remember it, because I used to speak French, uh, I you know I wrote something on the lines of. I'm sorry for my bad French, but this, this, and that, which started basically <laughs> like a scam letter. Uh, they they probably trashed it before I asked, uh, you know, uh, for their account number so that I can uh, transfer money from a Polish prince. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, in the end, I didn't yes. get a... F- I looked for it in the Netherlands because there are quite a few of these in the Netherlands, but uh, they were very rough around the edges. Uh, there was a... 
80s German export edition. It was so-called the DDR edition. It was uh, exported to uh, East Germany. And uh, it was like a luxury car there in the 80s. Mm. So I couldn't get one this one this one either because the one in a good shape would cost like fifteen twenty thousand euro. Uh, so yeah, I was looking for interesting cars from the eighties, nineties, seventies. Anything that actually would be interesting is either going to be really expensive or will be broken. So you've you've only got two ends because the eighties eighties and nineties mm. building capacity was kind of weird at the time. There's a lot of stuff that was hand built hand stuff put into cars by people rather than by machines and tolerances weren't great but like for my yoke i i i kind of like really boring 80 cars mm-hmm. they were boring at the time and i still kind of like boring cars now so so in the respect of like a ford escort or something that's just mm-hmm. really vanilla i like that kind of car because they stand out now because they survived um, and I like Toyota Corollas, old Corollas. The older, the better. Gen- closer to Generation One, you can get the better. They're just they're lovely cars because you're not you're never going to see anything like those ever again now to get. So the the kind of more boring that you can get, the more interested I become in a car. Mm-hmm. Oh my God! I just got a super chat. Super uh, chat, Anthony yes, C. Brown from Anthony C. Brown. Well, thank you. This is my first one, and. Uh, Wow. <laughs> uh, it's good, this, is a question, this is a question to you, Bob. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, does buying a BEV make sense for a working class family when oil prices are falling and uh, the popularity of BEVs is still relatively low? It's like he's reading my script. Yeah. You're I right, swear I was, about, I was about to ask that. That is, that is a bloody good question because... To buy a BEV in Ireland is actually very expensive. It's it's forty thousand euro, forty to forty fifty thousand euro, and there's mm-hmm. there's there's discounts given, there's grants given off that, and running an EV over over a couple of years, maybe three years, four years, you'll start to see the savings for sure in the price of electricity. Mm-hmm. That's if electricity remains at the price it is now. If it doesn't rise, which of course it's going to, because prices only go one way. At the moment, we have oil prices dropping through the floor. Prices of petrol and diesel is getting cheaper and cheaper every single day. And you can pick up a relatively good used family car in diesel form or even petrol form and drive it as far as you want to drive it for about the same price as an EV. So Mm -hmm. unless you're looking environmentally right now, the best way to do is just buy an ordinary internal combustion engine and just drive it on. Yeah. I mean, before the whole corona crisis, I was thinking about buying an electric car and I'm mm. still thinking of it. It's somewhere in the back of my head. I also spoke to a uh, company who would install solar panels on my roof so that I could actually produce energy to to use to, to simplify things, to power my house and to charge the car, but in fact to send enough energy to the grid so I could get enough back free to um, to make the car uh, to make the car CO2 neutral yeah uh, but first of all the car would not pay for itself unless of course I did a YouTube series about it and uh, you know um, it picked up got million views etc yeah uh, which is actually something I'm considering if I go ahead with this project uh, it's gonna be a it's gonna be a YouTube series as well we'll and... all be fully charged soon. <laughs> kind of, kind of, yeah. Mm, you know, maybe I should have them on as uh, as guests one day. Um, sure, yeah. Ask them real questions. See, see how tough you can ask as an actual journalist. Ask them real questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but anyway, um, this is one of the one of the things I'm uh, I'm considering. However, it's just going to be expensive, and the, the solar panels they can can pay for themselves. And it's actually I've done the math, and it's a right. Um, but the uh, the car, not not by a long shot. No, I don't think so. There's so much compromise to make in electric cars. There's so much, and there's so many variables. Like if you want to charge, if you have to charge, you're in a big country, right? You're in a country where it's a very long distance between places. I'm in a country where it's not quite as long a distance, mm-hmm. but there will be occasions where I'll have to charge on the street. And on street mm-hmm. charging is expensive and doesn't get any cheaper. Mm-hmm. And uh, you, often you have to pay for parking as well as pay for street, on street charging. Yep. So wow. sometimes you pay double on what you're going to do. And then 
It's just a convenience. I just, mm-hmm. it just drives me nuts having to plug the car in and out every time I want to use the car. Every couple of days you're charging this car. That, there's just, I don't there's a big mind that much. I don't mind the plugging in bit. I can, I can live with that. It's uh, just not having a place to charge when I want to go somewhere further. That's, that's a bit annoying. Yeah. I've seen that. I've seen the Carwell review where they kind of tested the range of a number of electric cars. And, you know, they would go off the motorway every 10 or 15 miles to another charging point. Wow. I mean, yeah, yeah. In Poland, it's like 150 kilometers from one charger to another, and you never know if it works. <laughs> same, it's kind of the same here. You can use various apps to get you where you want to go and get to the charge point you want. But mm-hmm. whether they're actually working when you get there, whether they're occupied, yeah. you look on the map and it's not occupied. But by the time mm-hmm. you get there, someone's just plugged in and now you're suddenly in a queue of things trying to get a charge and... It's all very awkward. <laughs> um, Zdenko Panezic, is that how you how you pronounce it? Because that's uh, somewhere from the Balkans, I guess. Uh, hi, American Bob. I can't stop thinking about you lads destroying a Mazda 121 and Nissan Tida. That would be epic. Well, that's an idea, actually. You know, we could, do that, if yeah. we, we could buy uh, 80s cars and, uh, you know, destroy... Well, these were, would be 90s cars, Mazda 121. Um Unless we get the one which used to be a Ford Festiva. Oh, yes, that's true, yeah. Which yeah, was also Festiva. a Kia something. Your Mazda 121, did that look like a Ford Fiesta? That was the Ford Festiva you had over there as a Fiesta over in the UK and Ireland. That's no, no, correct. No, no, no. The, 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 the Ford Festiva, I think, was the Mazda 121, like a rebadge from mm. the 80s or something. Um, that whatever. Could, we could it make was, that happen. We could make that happen, then, they, then they made the, the, the cute, cute four-door Mazda 121. The, the 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 sedan the yeah, yeah the tiny sedan that was so cute and I would never destroy that uh, no. but the but the the earlier one yeah I wouldn't have any uh, problems with that so yeah maybe that's uh, maybe that's an idea uh, I would happily take a sledgehammer and possibly burn a Nissan T to, to the ground no problem I don't know about that <laughs> uh, okay this is something that's been sort of uh, hanging out uh, hanging out there for a while Aaron Malane, the Petro 94. Come on, Aaron. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what are your thoughts on the Mark 8 Golf? I have a Mark 7 currently and considering to upgrade. I'm not sure on about the screens. I think they will date very quickly. Keep your Mark 7. I wouldn't change to a Mark 8. I wouldn't. I, if I had a Mark 7, I wouldn't go to Mark 8. If yeah. I had a Mark 5, I'd go to Mark 8. No problem. But for Mark 7, is such a good ticks every little box. Yeah. And it's nice to drive and looks well. Mm-hmm. I think the Mark 8 looks a little bit weird on the front. For, I can't quite... Certain colors, it looks really strange. Uh, but yeah, I mean, not worth an upgrade, I guess. It's uh, it's it's one, nice. The 1.5 but... TSI is a kangarooing one as well. That's mm-hmm. the... 1.4 was the best engine Volkswagen, I think, nearly every made. Mm-hmm. Uh, the 1.5 is the one that does the kangarooing jobby, um, so it needed a fix. But they, but they they fixed something, because I was at the Mark 7.5 launch event uh, a couple of years ago, mm. and I remember it felt totally castrated at the time, especially, yeah, yeah. especially that they had a uh, 1.4 Beetle as a whatever camera car, so I kind of drove them back to back, and they were pretty similar in terms of weight and everything, but dynamically, the 1.4 was a much more dynamic engine and yep. now in the 1.5 over the years they must have improved the software again and uh, it, i love the improved the software yeah, again. yeah. <laughs> and uh, it works fine now still from seven to eight i probably i probably wouldn't uh wouldn't bother mm. it, they look the same even uh, apart from the front when you put them side by side they actually look kind of similar mm-hmm. side on so and I know the colors are nicer and some of the some of the stuff inside the car around the dashboard and things is a bit nicer and some of the software is nicer. But really, the, the step up would be like going from an iPhone 10 to an iPhone 11. It's not going to be a huge step, you know. Pretty much. Yeah. OK, let's see. Let me just uh, uh, let me just uh, have a look here at the last comments because uh, whew, we've been talking for a while. Uh, I thought we we're going to be yeah. done in an hour, but uh, you. you you and I, we just won't shut up. No, uh, do... it's great, though. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's the I chat. That this is, this is what it's all about. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, do we have a favorite hybrid car? 
No. <laughs> <laughs> unless it's very, unless you count a McLaren you were driving, that's a hybrid, isn't it? Uh, no, that one wasn't. That one still oh, wasn't. Was no, it was, there was nothing electric about it. Uh, um, hmm. I think of a hybrid car. I kind of like the Skoda Superb PHEV, but that's a plug-in hybrid, which would be exactly. different from hybrid. I'm, I've got a few plug-in hybrids lined up in the next mm, few me too. weeks or months, and uh, I want to see how they improved since, um, say, Volvo, because I remember Volvo XC90 T8, and it wasn't brilliant. Mm. Prius PHEV was okay, but it was very expensive for a Prius and for a plug-in hybrid. BMW. I like the Volvo XC90 B5. That's a hybrid. That's a nice car. That was old. You, the B5 one? one. It's called B5. We had it here for a while. That was a, hy a, a hybrid one that I had. It was lovely. Oh, maybe that was just a diesel. Hold on a minute. Maybe I think that, that was a diesel because they, 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 the, the plug-in hybrids are T8s. A T8. Yeah, no, that's right. I had the Volvo XC90 T8, which is a plug-in hybrid. Yeah, mm. I've had that. That's luxury and all, but it's still... Mm. There's another super chat. Look at that. You see, people are so generous, aren't they? Just yes, brilliant? yes. The Irish Car Channel is promoting itself. <laughs> You're that's you promote away. Uh, are MPVs a dying breed with the rise of the small SUV? Wild hybrid. Yeah. And uh, to be honest, uh, I would love a good MPV. I really like a good MPV. Me too. Um, I like even the smaller ones, like the Golf Super. Sports, sports van, whatever it used to be called Golf Plus, and yep. then it was called the Golf SV. So I'm even into that. Yep. Uh, the smaller, the smaller Ford C Max, because there were like two wheelbase, I think, versions. They had lovely seats. C Max had a lovely seating position and just the right mm -hmm. height, hip height, and stuff. It's really nice. It was just a lovely, mm -hmm. lovely car. That it was a, it was a lovely car, but apparently people are not buying them. <laughs> no. That's the problem. Once people get onto the idea that a car looks really good outside the door, they start to lose the practicality mm -hmm. into the car, which is where, like, mm -hmm. if you look at seven, proper 7C mm -hmm. cars, like a Ford Galaxy or one of those big cars, they do a, such a great job. Mm -hmm. And yet people will go out and buy a 7C off-road vehicle of some sort with big 7, and the two rear seats are useless in it. But they'll buy it because they think it's the right car for them. So there's, there's an element that goes on as well. Mm -hmm. But, like, small SUVs, it's a fashion thing. I think it'll fade out over time mm -hmm. as the market becomes saturated with them. And we'll end up looking back to estates and back mm -hmm. to MPVs, where it should be. Uh, I hate to say that it's another Volkswagen, but I've just recorded <laughs> a review of a T-Cross. Uh, T-Cross with a 1.5 TSI engine. Very good engine, That's a finally. Nice car, yeah. And, uh, you know, it sort of gives you everything that the Golf that's parked outside my house right now doesn't give you. And it's a very nice car. It's got a sliding mm -hmm. bench in the back, USB ports, everything. Uh, good car. And I have uh, but, it's, diesel. but it is a crossover. The standard Passat is outside my door, two liter diesel. You will never need another car as long as you live. It just does everything. It's an estate car. <laughs> it's, it's just, it's a DSG. It's got active cruise control. It's got leather seats. It's got everything. It's a bit firm on the suspension, but that's okay. All Volkswagens are. And they used to do such nice cars like the Turan, the Charan, the, uh, yep. yeah, the Golf Plus, whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think they ever had a B, B uh, minivan, did they, in Volkswagen? No, no. All it, we did have, um, we had a Caddy Plus, Caddy Life. Okay, Caddy, but that was like more like a delivery. That's a van delivery van with yeah. some seats in the back of it, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, looking through the comments again, uh, what do we have here? Uh, there was a question I that caught my attention here, uh, something about hybrids still. Uh there's a question now. It popped up on the screen because Anthony C. Brown has paid some money to ask a question. Look at that. <laughs> uh, oh, again? Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> now, this is very generous of you. And in that case, uh, in that case let's, uh, let's answer that. Yep. Um, you jumped to the head of the queue there, Anthony C. Brown. Uh, wow. This, I mean... <laughs> If if things go like this, you know we're gonna we're gonna we just spend keep the whole talking. We're doing a marathon, right? We just keep going, just keep going forever, and tomorrow we'll be bought millionaires. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who cares about the crisis? Yeah, um, just keep going. Uh, Nissan Infinity uh, just left you a voicemail. Uh, they asked, uh, "What should uh, we have done 
to avoid insolvency. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot they could have done. One was get rid of Carlos Gosson out of Renault very quickly. Um, Nissan have not had a good line of cars. They've concentrated really hard on battery power, on their Leaf, mm -hmm. Uh, on their assistance for, for Renault, on trying to work together with Renault to make what, what they do work. And in the meantime, they've completely neglected their European fleet of any kind. Mm -hmm. So they, they have Leaf, they have the X-Trail, they have the Qashqai, which they've relied on for a very, very Heavily, long yeah. time. And what they really need to do is reinvent their small SUV, something smaller and tidier than uh, between Duke and Qashqai. They need something else. Duke is too controversial and Qashqai looks tired now. Mm -hmm. um, and they really need to do something in there. And realistically, they're going to have to work really fast over the next three years to try and avoid anything useful uh, coming out of this. Because if they don't break their ties with Renault and get away from Mitsubishi, which is what they're trying to get into bed with, they're going to be in deep trouble. Also, they've been working on a um, one of these sort of fancy drivetrains, kind of like Mitsubishi. That it's got a, it's a plug-in hybrid, hybrid electric, whatever, and they can't make yeah. make up their mind what it is. Um, as far as Infinity goes, uh, it's something I would have said, but it was actually said by um, uh, Jason Camisa a few. Uh, a year ago, I think. I've looked it up on his Instagram, actually. Right. And, um, uh, the American car journalist. And uh, he had this rant about the Infiniti QX50, I think. Uh, it's the QX50 that came out in the States and never made it to Europe, ultimately, because mm -hmm. uh, they withdrew from Europe at the time. And he said that if Infiniti focused on making good quality car as such rather than on uh, uh, fancy steering and uh, things like our fancy engine which nobody could understand and it didn't really make any sense it would be money better allocated yep and i think this is this kind of sums up the infinity part of the business Nissan used to sell a lot of Micros, right? Micro yeah. was one of the most bought cars mm -hmm. in the world. Everybody at some point in their life probably owned a Micro or had a Micro or their friends or relatives had a Micro. You probably learned to drive in a Micro. Mm -hmm. And yet they brought out a fairly decent Micro a couple of years ago and just seemed to forget about it. Just went, nah, we don't need that. Let's talk about Leaf. And we went off into Leaf again. And just this constant sort of, and they can't get batteries. Mm -hmm. They can't get components to make enough Leafs. Even if they had all the orders in the world, they can't deliver them because they don't have enough mm -hmm. batteries. No one does. So Nissan have been so long trying to push that electric car end of stuff that all of the rest of the fleet has fallen off. And I see um, Michael there has, has said about another car between Duke and, and Qashqai, but that's where the market is. That's what's selling. It's Duke and slightly bigger than Duke that's actually shifting on the market. And the Qashqai is too old now to start reinventing again. You know, you've got a lot of work to do between the two. So that's if the market is buying there and you don't have a car in that segment, mm -hmm. then it's you're just at, you're not racing there at all. You know. Uh, this is a question from uh, from my Polish viewer, uh, Pavo or Paul is asking you uh, whether it's normal in Ireland for an average family to buy new cars because in Poland buying a new car is still kind of a luxury. Uh, yeah, new cars are still seen as a luxury, but at the, at the same time, there is a status symbol about having a new car. There is a status symbol about having that latest license plate outside the door. So in essence, what a lot of people do in Ireland when they're buying a brand new car is that they're, they're making a statement to say, I can afford a new car. You know, that's what they're really at. So there is an element of that there, but people do... Um, buy it, it's it is fairly normal to buy an average family car here, a small SUV car here. Uh, uh, it's it's not really a luxury luxury unless you go into certain brands. You buy a brand new Mercedes or a new Audi or a new Beamer, then it's kind of seen as a luxury. Mm -hmm. uh, this is something I want to ask you about because this is something I never <laughs> could wrap my head he head around. Apparently, it's the same in the UK and Ireland where you have the number plates which kind of tell you the year of the model year of the car or the year yeah. it was purchased. Uh, how does it work? In Ireland, we have a very, we have, it, as Europe goes, we have the most straightforward version of it. So the first three numbers on our license plate uh, for, t for right now would be mm -hmm. 201. So 2020 will be 201, right? Okay. 
Uh, the next part would be the county that it's from. So if it's from Dublin, it'll have D written on it. And then the actual reg plate begins. The rest of it then is unique to the car. So it's just a set of numbers behind that. The UK has a different scheme. UK and Northern Ireland has this idea that you put a P or a D or an L or something at the beginning. And that tells you the year. And then there's all kinds of other digits after that as well. They've got probably the most complicated licensing license plate system that I've ever seen. Even the U.S. has some oddball ones as well, but even the U.K. is just crazy. Okay. Uh, I'll uh, answer a couple of couple of questions quickly because uh, they've been kind of hanging up there. Uh, yeah. Eric uh, Rockford asking whether I still have the MX-5 and any plans to hold it um, as a future classic. Now, I do have it, and I am planning to hold Stated. on to it. <laughs> Uh, not all of his all of his camera kits in the boot. <laughs> yeah, not for uh, not for the classic uh, market, rather. But uh, my girlfriend and I were thinking every now and then, you know, you know, maybe we should kind of dump this one and buy something else. And uh, every time we get back into the Mazda, it's like, oh my god, it's such a good car. Mm. Uh, it just brings a smile to your face. And I mean, I had a. Porsche Cayenne Turbo SE Hybrid Coupe, very long name, which is like whatever, 680 horsepower, super mm. hybrid, whatever. And uh, I can still go back into the Mazda MX-5 and it's still a great car. Yep. Agreed. I love them. I think they're mm. a lovely car. I don't know why. It, I don't know actually why more people don't buy them because every time someone asks me what kind of roadster they should get in the, you know a classic car I always go Mazda MX-5 and people just don't buy them and you're thinking Why? what's wrong with it like it's a great car they're just such a good car all the years mm -hmm. doesn't matter which one you pick really easy to fix parts are readily available everywhere they don't break down really and you can get pretty much anything you want in the boot yeah uh, Michael again uh, do you think we will have an EV revolution within the next five years in a form or of battery tech revolution or a new type of power source hydrogen mm. uh, no no I don't think so I no. really don't uh, I know they are working on hydrogen uh, for example in BMW to put it into their SUVs because they're thinking about long range so hydrogen would be easier and quicker to refill and offer you longer range for the amount of whatever fuel you would take mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I think it's just going to be kind of a shift you're going to be kind of like with public transport you're going to go on a uh, on a, one of these electric scooters city bikes uh, take a subway take a yep. bus and this is how the car is going to fit into the into the whole situation unless of course coronavirus will kill car sharing because for example in Poland car sharing businesses these days are uh, uh, are in trouble and to be honest since the car companies are in trouble as well bmw had a deal of a century last year and they sold something like 500 i3s to a car sharing company in warsaw so right. yeah around europe if you think car sharing you think whatever fiat panda fiat 500 something small you know that yep. kind of thing in poland um besides toyota yaris and uh whatnot uh, you can go in a BMW i3, and there are literally like 500 of them on the streets of Warsaw. Uh, and you can, as of recent, you can also go in a Jaguar uh, I-Pace. Oh, that's yes. too extreme, isn't it? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how many of them they sold to the car sharing company. Uh, I yeah. will have to find out, but um, as... So that's where all the I-Paces went. That's why the I-Pace is in so much trouble. You just sold 500 of them over to Poland. <laughs> No, I don't think it was 500, probably but more like five. But basically, yeah, they probably. sold whatever they had for this year. The whole allotment is gone. Job done. We don't need marketing. And actually, they did Amazing. fire their marketing and PR guy, which is a shame. But that's actually <laughs> due to ownership change. So it's not that he wasn't doing a, good, a bad job. It's just um, uh, their, the ownership will take, the ownership change will take a few months. And basically, they're selling whatever they have and they can't be bothered. Yeah. And with with contracts like that, I can understand why. Yeah, why would you bother? I mean, why why would you if you if you're gonna able to sell a whole heap of cars, just leave them there, and you don't have to worry about them or warrant them or do anything with them? Well, then you're never gonna have any complaints. I'd just sell them; they're gone. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, okay. Uh, by the way, actually, yeah. Mercedes have cancelled their hydrogen investment. They did that about three, four days ago. Oh. They've stopped investing now in hydrogen entirely and stopped that. They're just okay. going after electric. So the future of hydrogen That's now is is very, very risky. If Mercedes aren't doing it, Mercedes would be one. Mercedes invested something like 6.2 billion three years ago in technology and just research and development, electric, hydrogen, all that sort of stuff. And they just stopped on the hydrogen three or four days ago. So well, that really means that's the end of it. Like Maybe since Toyota released some of the patents, they didn't feel it was uh, necessary to research again, to research maybe. more. Because I, I think BMW will do Toyota Toyota's uh, hydrogen. Yeah. Yeah, they need uh, hydrogen. I think it's, 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 I think it might be part of the future at some point. But I think on a large scale, I think more like trucks and stuff is mm -hmm. going to be the one that'll get hydrogen first. Trucks, buses, mm -hmm. commercial transport. Yeah, it makes sense be... because there is a lot of place to store the hydrogen there. Yeah, yeah, and, and they, they are and they are working uh, relatively efficiently. Uh, mm -hmm. These these vehicles. Uh, okay, let's do last three or four questions and uh, wrap it up for tonight because uh, tomorrow I'm waking up at four to film the golf. <laughs> <laughs> I do it. Yeah, I do. Uh, yeah, because after in the afternoon it's gonna rain. So all right, I have to do it so, while it's clear. There's a man dedicated to his job. Do you know yeah. if it was going to rain, I just wouldn't film tomorrow. That's <laughs> how it works. I just go back to bed like but, I would. But you know what? It's the long weekend, and long weekend means oh, yeah. it's gonna rain throughout the long weekend. I mean, people, as the lockdown is becoming kind of less strict. People will. People are preparing to grill in their, you know, gardens, balconies, whatever, and uh, it's going to rain throughout the long weekend mm. because it's the it's the Constitution Day on third of May in Poland. So, fair not. I've already filmed a, a video for the weekend. It's the death <laughs> of the electric car. The first death of the electric car is the <laughs> video I'll be putting out tomorrow. Okay. So it'll be okay. Uh, questions from Mark and Bob. I watched both reviews. Each of you did Mazda CX-30 and I got the impression that both of you had very different experience. Can you both discuss that? Oh, did you like the Mazda CX-30? I was indifferent to it. Mm, I think it was, it, I, I'd be on the same lines. It was better than the Mazda 3, mm. definitely. At least the hatchback because I drove the sedan recently and the sedan was okay. I tried the Sky Active X engine and it does absolutely nothing. It's uh, and <laughs> it's it's. It, I I bet it's not the problem with the engine as such. It's the problem with the emissions and how they had to tune it to meet yeah. the emissions. Also, they now introduced the Sky Active G one fifty horsepower, mm -hmm. which means that people who bought the one twenty horsepower Mazda three or the one eighty Sky Active, they're shafted basically because uh, yep. they have a better engine hopefully better engine in the middle and cheaper <clears throat> yep that's cx cx30 to me was mm. uh it's a car that ticks a certain amount of boxes it's mm -hmm. it's okay at pretty much everything but it's not brilliant at anything in particular it's not it's not a great car mm -hmm. i don't think like if you're saying 10 years time that it's going to hold its value and right I, I really don't think so i think mazda consistently make things complicated for the buyer mm -hmm. They're always going on about Jin Bai Tai and horse and rider in one, and you know the yeah. Sky Active X and G and D. It's it's a it's a very Japanese thing to do, and it makes it very complicated for for someone to walk into a Mazda dealership and go, "I want a Sky Active G, one hundred and eighty horsepower." To, it's just too complicated. If they, if they leveled out the playing field, I think Mazda have a better thing. I think the CX thirty is could have been a great car, but I mm -hmm. think at some point the accountants got involved. And then the emissions got involved and everybody else got involved. The whole thing got, kind of got wishy-washy as to what it was going to be. Yeah. Um, another one from Irish Car Channel. How do license plates work in Poland? We just have different letters for different um, districts. I yeah, you do say. districts and zones, don't you? Yeah, yeah districts. So, yeah. Uh, so, for example, within Warsaw, you have... Uh, a number of uh, districts in case of uh, smaller cities you get uh, you get letters which uh, depend on the whatever area you're from so yeah, yeah it's like county states or something like that but yeah. it's it's got nothing to do with the with the model year uh so that's what it's like here mm. lads zdenko lads. 
Lads, uh, would you think the new Land Rover Discovery would be more reliable now? <laughs> no. <laughs> now, n now, as in now after whatever, two years since it was launched or now as in the new generation? <laughs> Because I keep seeing them on, on the back of a, of a yep. uh, tow truck. That's <laughs> me too. Everywhere I see maybe, them, maybe it's truck. just a delivery to, to, to service, you know, for service, you know, kind of a premium service like this. They pick up the car and they kind of take it on a flatbed truck. But uh... unfortunately, Land Rover for years have made things. Re they go for the highest pinnacle of everything tech wise. It feels great to drive. But if you look at, at reliability studies, mm -hmm. Land Rover consistently for years have been off on the bottom of them, even consumer satisfaction stuff whereby a Land Rover breaks down the brain of a dealership, they get treated really badly by the dealership or whatever it is. It just becomes this, this we, they make great cars, but they just make them too, too uh, finicky. They break down a lot. Uh, apparently, there's also a problem with av availability of parts, so it just takes too long. Uh, yeah. I know in Poland, people have been waiting for like simple parts for like, uh, you know, six months or something, mm -hmm. which is okay if it's uh, whatever, a scratched door which they cannot repair uh, or you know whatever broken piece of trim uh, it's a bit more of a problem if it's your panoramic roof yeah or your swing arm or something that you can't get it's just <laughs> just can't get them but yeah. i just i i love land rovers i love range rovers range rover vogue would be like dream oh, car yeah. you know you win the lotto you win, buy a range rover vogue it's yeah. the only car you're going to need but you will need a bank balance to run it as well because it's going to break down with something's going to go wrong in it Definitely. and then it's going to get expensive But yes, it would be a car that I would love to own and uh, I hope that uh, one day we will be able to treat ourselves to cars like these. Uh, yeah, just keep paying the super chats. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, exactly. Uh, so anyway, with uh, this uh, on this positive note, rather than a bombshell, uh, I think uh, this bomb. is uh, where we'll wrap up tonight. Uh, Bob, thanks very much for the last 90 minutes or, or so. No problem. Anytime. And, um, you know, I know it's your line, but, you know, we'll see you on the far side. Oh, yes. <laughs> I should record that. <laughs> uh, don't forget to subscribe to Bob, uh, all the links below. And, uh, yeah, I'll see you guys tomorrow in a review of something that Bob's already done <laughs> on his channel. So um, that's a little, little riddle for you. See you, Bob.